All right, are we ready to get started? Yeah. What do you right. think? What do we think? All right, well, we are super excited uh, to kick things off here. Um, I want to introduce our first speaker. Um, April Dunford uh, is a very close friend from Toronto of Catherine's and mine. We've known her from the B2B marketing community, the technology startup community, for the better part of 10 years. And April is one of these globe-trotting B2B uh, experts that has spoken to companies large and small. And what I love about April is that she brings a non-industry perspective. We've got a lot of industry rock stars that'll be speaking here today. But I think it's also really important to bring outside thinkers and outside experts who can shed some perspective on things that we may not know a, a lot about or we may be familiar with to some extent, but providing from another lens. So April, I don't want to be saying too much more, but is someone that I was actually quite surprised that we were able to lure out here from Toronto, although it's freezing and cold there, so maybe that's the reason she came, but has come out to impart great wisdom. I've heard her speak several, several times. She's a real treat, and it is so wonderful to be able to share her with you here today. Everyone, April Dunford. Um, is my mic on? <laughs> uh, thanks so much. Um, as Mark mentioned, I'm not from the promotional products industry, so you know, so maybe my role here is to be a little bit of the uh, uh, non-industry comic relief. Um, but my background is more as a marketing executive. So I've spent my entire career mainly in tech as a repeat VP of marketing. And so I thought what I would talk about today is a kind of high-level marketing concept that I think is super, super important to both marketers and entrepreneurs. So what I'm hoping that you learn out of this is kind of two things. So one, if you have customers that look like me or are senior marketing people that are struggling with this concept, um, I'm hoping you can take what you learn in this session and use it uh, to better help your customers accomplish their goal. Secondly, I think as entrepreneurs, I'm hoping you can use this concept to do a better job of making money for your own business. So what I want to talk about today is positioning. So positioning as a concept is not new, it's not exciting. In fact, most of the time I speak to rooms full of marketing people and if I ask them, hey, do you think there's anything new that you need to learn about positioning? People will look at me and say, no, we get it. We know how to do it. And then if I ask 10 people, define positioning for me, you will get 10 completely different answers. Um, I like to think of it as context setting for products, for companies, for offerings. And the idea is if you set the context properly, then the awesomeness of your offering is obvious. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, context setting is a bit of a funny way to think about this, so I'll start with an example of context and what I mean by context and how it can change how we think about an offering. So um, in 2007, the Washington Post did a very famous context experiment. Uh, in this experiment, they decided what they were gonna do is take a professional musician and they were gonna have him play outside of a busy metro station during morning rush hour. And what they were trying to measure was two things. One, if they had a professional musician, would people notice that the music was better that morning? And two, would a professional musician make more money than a regular street performer? So the guy they chose for this experiment is this guy. His name is Joshua Bell. At the time, arguably the best violinist on the planet. He's regularly selling out concert halls for $200 a ticket. Uh, it's great. If you Google this guy, there's this big bio of him in Interview Magazine. And they're trying to describe how beautiful his violin playing is. And so they say, the quote is, Joshua Bell playing the violin does nothing less than tell human beings why they bother to live. Good, right? So we're gonna take this guy and we're gonna expose that bother liveness stuff in front of the whole morning rush hour and we're gonna see what happens. So the guy goes out, they put him out there, um, he plays his guts out for two hours and what happens? He makes $34.73, not so good. So now the first time I heard this story, I thought, 
you know what, I take the subway to work every morning, and one, I don't have any change in my pocket, two, I am seriously late for a meeting, I don't care what day it is. So when I first heard this, I thought, okay, he didn't make so much money, I get it, but that doesn't mean people didn't notice, and maybe they were just too busy, so they got halfway across the plaza, heard this guy, had an epiphany about why they bother to live, and then had to keep going, because, you know, late for a meeting. Cool, dude. And so, but the New York, the Washington Post that ran this experiment, they're not stupid, so they thought, well, let's go and interview people that were in the square. So it turns out an awful lot of people were not in a big rush that morning. So it turns out where he's playing straight across, there's a lottery ticket kiosk, and there were a lineup of people standing in line to buy lottery tickets. So they went and they interviewed these people, and they said, hey, Guy was playing in here this morning. Did you notice anything different? Literally every single person they asked could tell you exactly the numbers they played on lottery tickets that morning. And when you asked them, did you notice anything about the music? They were all like, music, what music? Was there music? I don't remember a thing. Um, there was a woman with a shoe shine kiosk at one end, and they asked her, because she's there every morning, they said, hey, you're here the whole time, and you're here every day. Notice anything different, you know, this morning about the music? And she says, she turns around, there's video of it, it's hilarious. She turns around and she says, oh yeah, I noticed the music this morning. It was so loud, I was going to call the cops. <laughs> not exactly realizing why you bother to live. So what exactly is going on here? It's not just that we're too busy, we don't have change in our pocket. What actually happened is Joshua was completely undone by his context. So here he is. He's wearing a baseball cap. He's wearing kind of a bad shirt. He's standing in the dirty metro plaza. He's standing beside the garbage bin. People are walking by. Nobody's stopping. If I'm the shoe shine gal, I turn around. I assess the situation. I look at everything, and I say, yeah, street performer. Nothing to see here. Now, here's where this gets interesting. If I walked up to Shoeshine Gal and said, hey, congratulations, um, I'm going to give you some tickets to go see this guy played up the street. And she would go see Joshua Bell in his normal context. Now, here he is. And she would walk into this theater, and it would be all fancy wood, and I got a great big camera. And I probably got a, a program that says, oh, he won all these awards, and he's a child prodigy. And I got fans up front, and they're cheering and clapping. I look at the way he's dressed. Well, you know what's funny? He still actually dresses like a bum, but they, get, they, they surround him and dudes with white bow ties, so that kind of compensates. And I think she would kind of, same thing, have a look, assess the situation, look around and say, I don't know, man, that guy's a genius. Now, here's where it's important for us as entrepreneurs and people that sell stuff. The product, the offering, the thing we're trying to sell here is exactly the same in both situations. And it's a great offering. It's a fantastic world-leading product. But if I take even a great product and I pick it up and I put it in a lousy context, all of a sudden, I can't see it, I can't hear it, I can't understand it, I am not going to pay for it. Now, we, I think, intuitively understand, even though we're not violinists and we don't get to operate in a concert hall, I think we understand that context is important. Um, and we set it in different ways, sometimes unconsciously. So we set it by the competition we compare ourselves against. We set it by the features we decide to highlight in our offerings. We set it with branding and messaging. We set it with the customers we highlight. Um, promotional products, if I'm selling a product, I'm a marketer, promotional products is part of that mix. Um, interestingly, though, at least in my experience working in tech, uh, I, I think we get that all that stuff comes together to produce a context for what it is we're trying to sell, uh, but we often ignore it, and we set context in kind of an automatic, non-deliberate way. Worse than that, we often assume that there is only one context within which we can position our stuff. So I'm going to give you an example. This is a tech example, but um, maybe you can relate to this. So somewhat early in my career, I got hired as the vice president of marketing for a little tech company. And what the, the tech company was founded by two guys with PhDs in database technology. And what they had come up with was this revolutionary new kind of database. 
And so what their database did is if you had this giant mountain of data and you were trying to answer a question with that data, that sort of question would normally take like eight hours to have the database process that. And this, with this special amazing magic database, you could do it in like two minutes. So I got hired as the vice president of marketing. We have some customers and the whole idea is we're gonna put our foot on the gas and sell the heck out of this magic, magic breakthrough super duper technology thing. We got patents on this stuff. Everybody that works for the company has a PhD, big brain, super database magic stuff. So I get hired. I don't know a lot when I start about the kind of people that buy this stuff. So I figure what I'm going to do is I'm going to tag along with my sales rep when he goes out and pitches this thing to people. And I'm going to see how does everybody react when they first encounter this you know, revolution in database stuff. So, I'm there for a few weeks, my rep sets up a week full of meetings, and I go in and we do like nine meetings in a row, and every single one goes like this. My rep comes in, he sets up. Customer comes in, and I have like, you know, they're generally the people we're pitching to are big companies, so I have like the chief information officer and a bunch of people that are really big on database stuff. So they all come in, everybody sits down, and then my sales rep sits up and says, fantastic, I'm glad you're all here. What we're going to talk to you about today is a revolutionary, next generation, soup de duper new kind of database. And the minute he said that word database, you could see the body language of everybody in the room was like what we call assuming the yuck position, like no. Everybody gets like this. And then he would say, no, 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 you don't understand. This is amazing. We have PhDs, we have patents. This is so cool. This is like a database unlike you've ever seen before. And you could see everyone in the room was kind of like, uh-huh, that's great. Facebook's great too. Let me do some of that in this meeting. And so we'd lose everybody. And then you can see my rep, he's trying to get through slides. No, you don't understand how cool it is. It's so cool. It's like you've never seen. It's amazing, amazing. And we would get to like slide four. And then the senior person in the room would kind of put up her hand and say, yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for coming out, you guys. That's great. Uh, you got that cool database thing. But you know what? We don't need a database. We have a database. Our database is Oracle. Oracle, $5 billion company, whatever, been around for. Yeah, we have Oracle. Our folks are all trained on Oracle. They like Oracle. Yeah, I get you got some special PhD patent thingy, but we're not switching, and we don't need your stuff. What we'd really like right now is if you guys could, you know, get the hell out of our office. <laughs> and they kick us out, and we go back to the office and feel sad. Me in particular, I'm brand new. I'm like, I made poor choices, poor, poor choices, <laughs> poor choices. And so we did this like day after day after day. And like after like the sixth meeting or something, I said to my rep, I'm like, does it always go like this? He's like, yeah, it sucks. <laughs> it was like really bad. And so anyways, we got lucky. We got lucky. So the last meeting of the week where we're, you know, and I'm seriously bummed and thinking I gotta quit this job. Last meeting of the week, we get what we call um, the sympathy sales call, you know what that is? That's when the CEO knows a guy who knows a guy who agrees to give you an hour because he feels sorry for you. So we have one of those, we go in, we set up, it's just him, and my rep goes into the pitch and the, the prospect sits there super polite and lets us go through the whole thing. He's like super polite, nice guy. Canadian. And so <laughs> we, get, we get through the whole thing and we get to the very end and he says, he says, gets to the end, he says, I love it. It's fantastic. My God, really, I love it. And we're so excited. Yay, someone loves our stuff. We're all excited. And he says, you know, at the beginning, you guys were talking and I had no idea what it was and I, I, I was so confused. But then all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, you're not a database at all. And so me and my rep are looking at each other. He loves us, he loves us. What's that? What? What? <laughs> he says, no, you're not a database at all. I got thinking about it, and I think you might be a business intelligence tool or maybe a data warehouse. Now, I had only been with the company three weeks, but my idea that we're database people and we sell a database thing was so strong that when he said that, my initial reaction was, I am going to have an argument with this person except I'm Canadian too. So we have this Canadian argument where we're super polite and super sorry. So I said, sorry, sorry, maybe I misheard you. I thought you said we weren't a database, but we can't be. And so I started listing, well, we can't be this other thing you think we are because we don't have these features. And you know, so we're having this Canadian fight. 
And, and he said, and finally he gets kind of like legit mad and says, look, databases do all kinds of things. You guys are really good at this one thing. And if I'm just thinking about that one thing, that puts you in a different market. You're actually a business intelligence tool. And holy cow, a like April, you're the vice president of marketing. Who gave you this job anyways? You don't even know what you are. <laughs> went back to the office and felt sad again. <laughs> but we went back to the office, felt sad. And then we said, you know what? What if we're not? What if we're not a database? What would that mean? And so first we had to get our own heads around it and say, OK, well, if we're not, if we were a data warehouse, could we be a data warehouse? And what it did is once we changed our thinking about it, it changed our entire business. Data warehouses were a commodity. Data warehouses were basically, or databases were a commodity. Data warehouses were basically a special database. The first thing we did was we put our price up because warehouses were expensive. We just put a zero on the end and everybody was like, okay, that's more like it. That's a bit more warehousey of you to do that. <laughs> And then we did, changed a bunch of our relationships. And we obviously had things we couldn't do that if we said we were a warehouse, we'd have to do so. But we made some strategic partnerships. It eventually changed the new products we came out with. But the biggest change was that we got to go in and nobody compared us to this big competitor Oracle anymore. All of a sudden, we went in and said, we're in this other business. We do this different thing. And it gave us permission to get through the sales pitch and get to the cool stuff because nobody had a data warehouse yet. Um, we're bad at this. Every company I've worked at, we've had to struggle with this. Like exactly what are we and what do we do and why does anyone care and who cares the most? Um, I, I, so I've done this so many times, I think I know why it happens and I think I can teach you in like 10 minutes how to not do that. So most of us, when we start our companies or we launch a product, we start with an idea that we say, uh, we're going to go make an existing thing better. So you know, in my case, it was like, we're, we've got to build a better database, or we're going to build a different kind of email system, or we're going to build a better car. And then we launch something. We get it in the hands of customers. Customers like some of it. They don't like other things related to it reiterate on it. At the same time, the industry itself is changing. Your competitors are doing things differently. And so we're iterating, we're iterating, we're iterating. And the idea of the thing we initially set out to build is kind of getting stretched. So my database starts looking like a data warehouse. My email starts looking like chat. My car starts looking like something else. And but we, as the entrepreneurs, we kind of don't see it because, you know, I, I, of course we're databases. We've always been in the database business. How do you like my database back there? And meanwhile, customers that have never seen the thing before, encountering it for the first time, uh, look at it and you show up and you say, hey, what do you think about my great car? And the customer's like, oh, dude, I don't know. Like, you keep calling that thing a car, but when I look at it, all I see is a murder robot and I'm scared and these two things don't match. Um, often, if they really don't match, the customer will just make up their own mind what you are and you might not like the decision they make. Um, so context, the way you said it, can either highlight your strengths or it can hide them completely. Um, I'm going to give you an example that has nothing to do with tech, but, um, but I think it's illustrative of the point. So let's say instead of being promotional products people or tech people or whatever, we woke up, we're, we're actually bakers. And so we decide what we're going to do is we, we've been in the cake business for a long time and we're going to innovate on cake. And so I decide what if I had cake that instead of it being a dessert, it was like a little snack and I could drink coffee in one hand and eat cake in the other. And so I come up with this innovative thing here. I don't know what I'm calling it yet, but here it is. And so because it goes so well with coffee, I decide I'm gonna go and pitch it to the lady at Starbucks and get her to buy my thing and sell it at the Starbucks. So I'm gonna call her up and pitch it. And so here's my, here's my uh, pitch. Are you ready? I'm really good at pitches. In tech, we do these things called pitch contests. They're horrible. People get up and they have like two minutes and they talk about their business and nobody has any clue what they're talking about, but we're all polite. And so we, we clap. And usually I get invited as the, as the judge, which is terrible because then they ask me, well, what did you think? And I try to be like the nice judge 
you know, like, and so I don't want to discourage anyone from following their dreams. So I'm a bit like, hey, it's great, I love it. You should, you know, follow your dreams, even if your dreams are utterly incomprehensible to human beings. Just keep <laughs> right following them. Okay, so here's me pitching to Starbucks lady my innovative cake thing. So I call up, hey, Starbucks lady. I'm a baker, I specialize in chocolate cake, and I got this revolutionary cake 2.0 thing. It's amazing new revolution in cake. And what it is, is it's a cake that you don't need a knife and a fork. You're actually gonna eat it with your hands. It's fantastic. So we took, we took the cake and we made it kind of small, and then we decided we wanted to make it portable, so we give it like a handle. It's not really a handle, it's more like a stick. So what we did was we got like revolutionary cake on a stick. Cake 2.0, innovation in cake. It's fantastic, you should buy some. And Starbucks lady is on the phone thinking, no, that's not what you built. What you built was Frank and cake. What you built was cake doing things cake wasn't meant to do. It's cake gone bad, that's what that is. Because the first thing I did was I put myself in the cake market. I said it was cake. What wins the cake contest? The cake is cake in town, that's what wins. What's cool about my thing? It's the stick and the little ball thing. And everything that's cool about my thing is fundamentally not the cake part. The cake part is the least interesting thing about it. So I could have pitched it in a different way by positioning it in a different market. So I could have called up the Starbucks gal and said, hey, Starbucks gal, I got thinking about things you could sell at Starbucks and we came up with this revolutionary new thing. What it is is a lollipop, but we want it for grown-ups and to go with coffee, so we made it out of cake. That's a different thing. I have different competitors there. And the cool thing is, of course it's got a stick. It's a lollipop for goodness sakes. It's obvious it's got a stick. It's obvious it, whatever. And if I'm a grown up and I want to get my lolly on at the coffee shop, cake wins. Cake pop wins this contest. Um, it's different. How we set context is a bunch of different ways. So. Um, when we go to do this, the hardest part is we're so rooted in the way we think about our own businesses. So the first thing you have to do is kind of let go. You know, we've always been in the cake business. Maybe we're not in the cake business. We've always been database people. Maybe we're not. So you have to figure out a way to kind of, you know, free your mind, let it go. And then the next thing you have to do is think about what have we got that's amazing? What have we got that's special and valuable? What sets us apart and makes us different? than all the other competitive alternatives out there. And then you need to think about what is the market context that I could put my stuff in that makes my special, amazing secret sauce obvious to the people I'm trying to sell it to. That's kind of how it goes. Once you get that, then you have to bring the full bear of everything related to your company to drive that message home. So it's the way you talk about it in messaging and branding. It's the way the features you build into your product. It's uh, pricing, packaging, partnerships. All those things come together to set context. So I'll give you another example. And again, this is tech, but I love this example so much. So I work with this company. They're, um, they're uh, uh, similar to my database people. These guys are uh, robot guys with PhDs in robotics, and they started a company building robots. So they sell robots for a long time, and then they get this new idea for a new kind of robot. And what it does is it drives around a manufacturing plant, and it delivers things from one place to the other. Now, if you're like me and you don't know a lot about robotics, that might not sound like a hard problem to solve. It turns out it's a super hard problem to solve. It requires sensors and mapping and artificial intelligence. It's super high tech. So these guys come up with this thing, here it is here, and they, uh, so then they're gonna go out and pitch it to manufacturing plants and say, hey, we've got this fantastic robot. So they go in, they say, hi, uh, the name of our company is ClearPath Robotics, and what we sell are these revolutionary new kinds of robots. The problem was, robots are not new in manufacturing. They've been using robots for decades, and when you say robot, they think this thing over there. And those robots are not filled with artificial intelligence. In fact, they're totally stupid and they do totally stupid repetitive things like picking up a plastic bucket and putting it in a box. No sensors, no mapping, they certainly don't move around. So what they would find is that they would have to really work at getting these folks to understand why their robots were unlike any other robots they'd ever seen. 
So eventually, again, they took a step back and they said, what's special about us? Sensors, mapping, moving around, artificial intelligence. None of those things are central to our definition of what a robot is. So we, they decided, okay, maybe we're not in the robot business. Maybe what we're doing is something else. Uh, so then they said, okay, what would make it obvious? So what's moving around, full of artificial intelligence and sensors and mapping, what does that? <laughs> the Roomba, someone says. It's funny. <laughs> you know what? These guys, these guys pitched it once to a VC, and you can imagine they're artificial intelligence guys, and they're like, and the original one they had was kind of round, and they did have a VC go, so wait a second, the thing's like a Roomba, and they were so offended because they're like, they're like, we are artificial intelligence geniuses. We don't make vacuum cleaners. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they had a really funny story about being mad. So close though. So they said maybe what we are is a self-driving car. That sounds cooler. So then they came in and said, oh, you know what we are? We are autonomous vehicles for industrial uses. Ooh. So when they go in and they tell a manufacturer that, everything changes. So first of all, they don't expect their existing robot vendors to sell that, because those aren't robots. Those are something different. They don't expect it to be priced like regular robots. Because a self-driving car is way cooler. It's probably more expensive. This is good. Um, they certainly don't expect to, and of course it drives around. Of course it has mapping. It's a self-driving car for goodness sakes. Now what's interesting, if you look at this example, is how they drove that positioning home was the entire company shifted. So first of all, they changed the name of their company, so you can see it on the thing here. So they're not ClearPath Robotics anymore, they're called Auto, O-T-T-O, to drive home this idea that they're a car. If you look at the way they name their features, they have a feature where you manage a whole bunch of these things together, and they call it fleet management. Um, they even went so far as to change the industrial design look of this thing. So you can see it's got little white lights at the front and little red lights at the back, like headlights and brake lights. It's a robot, it doesn't need brake lights. That is literally just there to get you thinking of this thing like a car. And then they went back to their uh, potential investors that were like, you guys are like a vacuum cleaner thing going around. And instead they get to go in and said, maybe you've heard of this guy, Elon Musk. We're doing this like Elon Musk shit here. Maybe you'd like to write us a check. <laughs> and, they rose, and they raised $30 million on this new positioning. Um, what I want you folks to think about, because I realize none of my examples have that much to do with promotional products, although I will say um, these guys here, I called them when I knew I was coming to talk at this conference, I called them and I said, hey, do you guys ever do anything cool with promotional products? And they had a bunch of funny stories. So when they first did the repositioning, so they had always given away pens and t-shirts and things, and so they were doing this big new launch at a show. and. Um, and so they changed all of their promotional stuff to be super car oriented. So the first thing that they gave away at the new show was fuzzy dice. And so that was this like, you know, we're car people and we do car things. Now they give away things like seatbelt cutters and car chargers and things like that. So everything, you know, their whole sort of look and feel and branding is all very car, car oriented. You guys will come and tell me afterwards how shitty that was and there's probably a way better thing. And I hesitate to even use that because I'm like standing in front of the room full of super experts on this stuff and they're like, yeah, nice try, April. Uh, what, what, what are they called again? We'll call them. Um, but there's two things I want you to think about here. Um, so one, this concept of using context to help differentiate yourself I think is useful in two ways for you. So the first is, your clients are trying to do this. So they are trying to differentiate themselves from other things in, the, in their industry. They're trying to stand out from the crowd. They're trying to make the nut of their secret sauce obvious to the folks around them. And promotional products play a piece in that. The deeper you understand what it is about their offerings that makes them special, the more you can provide good consultation to them and how your offerings can help them do that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is for you in your own businesses, I challenge you to think about where you came from, where you are now, and think about what is it that you do now that is really special? What do you provide co um, 
customers that is really different and really amazing compared to other folks? What is the nut of your secret sauce? And then how do you redefine what you do in a way that makes it obvious to the folks looking for services like yours? Like, I should choose these folks because they're excellent at this thing. And how do you make that pop? Um, I have one last example. Again, it's a tech company, but th th you guys might relate to this. So um, again, I got hired, uh, this is super early in my career. I got hired as the head of marketing for a company that sold software. And what it was was enterprise CRM, customer relationship management. And so we were selling to big, big, big companies. And what we had was this way of managing you know, customer data. At the time, there was a giant company in Silicon Valley that was by far the market leader in that called Siebel. And Siebel was uh, 9,000 employees, 2 billion revenue. We were this dumpy little Canadian company with 25 people, maybe about a million revenue. And so our plan, because we were so smart, was to basically take those guys on and sell a better thing than them. So, uh, when I started, we weren't doing so hot at that, as you might imagine. If you looked at the leader's set of features, there was this big, long tick box of things. And if you looked at our set of features, it was a little wee short tick box of things. And they had five billion customers, and we had like five. And they'd been in the industry for 10 years, and we were brand new. And the only thing we had going for us is we were so desperate for business, we had a like unlimited willingness to discount. <laughs> So if you came to us and you really didn't care about features and quality or anything else, we could give you this, you know, kind of crappy CRM for cheap. <laughs> that was, you know, we didn't think of ourselves that way, but that's kind of how customers interpreted it. Now, we had a feature that no other CRM had. Uh, but hilariously, we, did, we couldn't figure out who wanted it. So we always worked it into the demo and in our pitches when we went in to talk to people, we said, hey, we have the ability to manage, you know, model relationships between people in a different way than other CRMs. And most of the time what we got was, uh-huh, whatever. How much does it cost? <laughs> no one cared. So we, we knew what our special sauce was. We just couldn't figure out who actually cared about our special sauce. Anyways, we were struggling, struggling. We had a few customers. They weren't very good customers. We always worried they would leave us or someone else would come into the market and be cheaper than us because that was literally our only good thing. And um, in the middle of this desperation, we got a new sales rep. And this sales rep had a buddy who happened to be the head of investment banking at Goldman Sachs. So he says, and in fact, he got hired on this pitch. He says, if you hire me, I'll get you a meeting with the head of investment banking at Goldman Sachs. And we're like, that sounds good. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> and so I went down with him. So we're going to meet the head of investment banking at Goldman Sachs. And he's a great sales rep. He comes in. He's buddies with this guy. So he does the pitch and the whole thing. And he goes through the, you know, our normal product pitch, which all it included at the end a demo where we showed this thing where you could model this, you know, our special sauce thing. And so he models that thing, and you could tell his buddy, head of investment banking, wasn't really paying attention until we got to that. And then suddenly he perked up, and he coughs his head, and he says, wait, 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 show me that thing again. So we showed it to him again. And then he's saying, so are you saying if I have one person that sits on a board over here and another guy that sits on the same board but works at a different company, I can model that in your thing? Yeah, we can. So like, wait. So if they both belong to the same golf club, I can model that. Yeah, you can model that. He's like, wait. And then he asks us like five more questions. He's like, hold the phone. And then he runs down the hall, and he has three vice presidents that work for him. And he brings these three vice presidents back. He's like, dude, you got to check this thing out. Show them the thing. Show them the thing. So we show them the thing. And they're like, holy cow. So you're saying I can model if this, this. And they said, yeah, we can do it. And, he's, you, you, and they got so excited. And so we're in this little office and all the bankers are like so excited. They're jumping up and down, jumping up and down. And I'm sitting in the corner like, have you ever been in a room full of super excited investment bankers? It's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> terrifying. And so they're all excited. They're like, we need this shit. We need it now. And so we, and so we closed this deal. It wasn't a gigantic deal, but we closed the deal. And and we closed it fast. Up until then, 
Well, our deals took like six, nine months to close, and there were all this discounting. They paid full price, and they paid right away. We're like, wow, we're on to something here. I wonder if all investment bankers go crazy when we show them this thing. So then we ran this little campaign and tried to get some more meetings. And every meeting we had was the same thing. We'd get in, we'd get to the part where we showed them this thing, and then all of a sudden they would be jumping up and down, great excitement, investment banking. So we went back to the office and said, maybe we've been doing this wrong. Maybe we're not enterprise CRMs. Because every time we say that, everyone compares us to the leader in enterprise CRM, because that's obvious. But we did know that we had one thing that bankers really cared about. So we thought, maybe what we are is enterprise CRM for bankers. And we don't really care about anybody else. Because you know what? Nobody else cares about us. This was a very difficult decision to make. When we first made it, everyone was terrified that that market was too small to support our business. How are we going to be a billion dollar company? How many, how many investment banks are there? Is there enough? Could we really just sell to investment banks? And then there was great anxiety in the sales force. They're like, wait, I'm only going to sell to investment banks? That sounds scary. What if a telco comes and wants something? We're like, they, they don't. <laughs> We've never had a telco come and want something from us. In fact, nobody wants us except this thing. So we repositioned ourselves as CRM for investment banking. And some magic happened in that. The first thing was this competitive comparison thing. So we could come in and say, hi, we're CRM for investment banking. And they're like, oh, is that like what Siebel does? We're like, no. Those Siebel guys, they're fantastic. We love them. They're so successful. Two billion. They're fantastic. If you're a call center in India, or a manufacturer, or maybe in retail or something, not you, Wolf of Wall Street. You need something special. Let me show you this thing. And then I'd hit them with the thing. Like, we completely changed our demo, too. Like, we basically just showed them the thing, because that's all we needed to do. And frankly, everything else we had was kind of crap. So we just say, no, look at the thing. Forget about that other. Just look at the thing. Look at the thing. It's amazing. And so we'd show them the thing, and then they would get all excited, and we'd close some business. And we trained all of our sales reps to like be super bankerish. And so we laid all these landmines for the Siebel people because we knew the Siebel, because they were so big, every time they came in, they did the exact same demo. And their demo, if you looked at it closely, was a call center demo. So you can imagine, here I am, the head of investment banking. I make $20 million a year-ish. And you're showing me a scenario where I'm like a guy that works in a call center. I don't want to see that. So we would, we would lay these landmines for them and say, oh, yeah, the Siebel guys are great. You know what you should do? You should book a meeting with them and see their demo. It's awesome. It's going to look a little call center-y, though, I'll warn you now. And then the Siebel guys would come in, and they'd, uh, the bankers would be like, dude, this is nothing like our business. Our reps, we had demo that looked like investment banking, scenarios that were all laid out for investment banking. We taught them all this investment banker lingo, like, oh, you know, you have to maintain your Chinese wall, which is like a banker term about security. And so we sounded super smart and super tailored for their business. It revolutionized everything we were doing to the point where um, when I joined, we were about a million in revenue. In 18 months, we did about 80 million in revenue. and. Um, and we were causing Siebel so much pain uh, that the, eventually uh, the Siebel came in and decided to acquire us. And they did acquire us for $1.7 billion. <laughs> Went back to the office, didn't feel sad. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and what was the hilarious thing about that was of all the companies I've worked at, that one had the most spectacular outcome. And our worry at the time was, are we going to make enough money? Is this going to be big enough to support our business? It's a bit counterintuitive, but sometimes focusing down on this small, small, tightly defined market can actually really make your differentiators pop and really make you stand out for the people that are going to love you the most. Um, so I want to leave you with this thought. Um, uh, as entrepreneurs, um, you know, every day we kind of stand on a stage in order to sell things to people. But we, again, we often kind of ignore the stage that we get up on. And so we kind of reflectively keep talking about ourselves the way we've always talked about ourselves. And we stand on the stage that we've always stood on. And so what I want to challenge you folks to do is to really think about, OK, I'm going to get up on a stage anyway. I'm going to talk about my stuff no matter what. 
So what is the right stage I'm standing on? Am I cake or am I cake pop? Am I a street performer? Am I a concert violinist? Am I robots or am I a self-driving car? And so I want you to really think about that, think about your business, and think about what you can do to really make the awesomeness of what you do obvious. And that's it. I wasn't, so this afternoon, I'm doing a session, and, what, uh, and I thought what we do in that session is kind of do questions and answers and stuff, but I have a little schmidgy time on the clock, and so if somebody wants to ask a question now, we could do it, or you can save it till later, um, but if, is, does anybody have a juicy question? Here's Catherine. So this She's going to ask me a question. I, I, do, I do have a question, but this mic is on. If uh, people want to come up and ask questions here, you can also put questions through on the app, and Kate's monitoring that to bring those forward. So April, if you're waiting, I can tell you about, I gave this talk in France, and they had the app where you could ask questions, and then the guy came up and he read, everyone could vote on the questions, and the guy came up and he read the most voted for question was, will you marry me? <laughs> That's the French idea of humor, right there. <laughs> and I, yeah. So don't be asking that. <laughs> I'm not answering. <laughs> But so is there any, uh, there's a question here, yeah. Sure, you want to back it up? This one here. Oh, these, the three steps. So here's how the three steps work. So the first one is, you know, I used to have on this slide, decontextualization. That, that went over big, so I took it out. Now I use, like, you know, cartoons. <laughs> But the idea is you have to kind of deframe yourself. And so when I think about every company I ever worked at where we worked on this, the hardest part was this. Like the hardest part was, you know, we're database people. We can't not be a database. We've always been a database. And so it's this idea of saying, just put that aside. Maybe we're not cake. You know, well, let's just put it aside. And then the second step is isolating your key competitive advantages. So you know, it, it kind of like my example with the cake pot. If it's, if it's stick and ball, then let's write that down. Stick and ball, that's what we do. If it fits my robot example, it's driving around, artificial intelligence, sensors, mapping, it's that. If I had done it for my database thing, I would have said, okay, or, or my CRM example, I would have said, okay, the ability to model a many, many relationship is my special sauce. And then the last piece is, okay, if that's your special sauce, then what context makes that obvious? So in the case of my robot guys, it's, you know, if moving around, mapping, sensors, whatever, is my special sauce, robot's a bad context, because robots don't do that. And so what we tend to do is we tend to say, no, but we're special robots, and we try to stretch that thing. When sometimes it's better to just say, moving around, artificial intelligence, whatever, you know what, we're self-driving cars for manufacturing plants. Or maybe, you know, if we had a really, in my CRM example, if we had a really hunkered down on it and said, okay, our thing is this modeling a many-to-many -many relationship, who cares about that? How do we contextualize that? Well, it's not enterprise CRM because the majority of people in enterprise CRM do not give a toss about that. So who does? And so when we did this thing where we said, okay, it's just for investment banking, and then we could show, like it's fundamental to an investment bank to be able to do that kind of modeling. And so putting it in that context made it very clear we were doing something different and it was super differentiated from the general case of CRM. So those are the three steps. The presentation yeah, is Yeah, and I'll send you guys well. the slides and you look. They're, they're pretty minimal slides. So April, the question that I had for you, so we joke in, about the fact that we are a branding industry, but we have a major branding problem, yeah. and that we are everything from advertising specialties to tchotchkes to trinkets and trash to promotional products to swag, you know, that no one knows kind of what verbiage to use. Right. And I'm curious as to what your views are on how to manage stretching that element of kind of redefining yourself 
without getting to the point where all of a sudden you've called it something different that your customer can't understand. And I'll give you the example that at Right Sleeve, at one point we tried calling ourselves like a promotional solutions agency or something. What the fuck is that? So this, right. <laughs> trying to find right. that mix of <laughs> how to, to say something that your customer understands, but also not position yourself in a way that limits you. That's right. So that, that's actually a super important concept in this, right? The goal of your context is to make things easy, obvious, like super easy to understand, obvious. So the context has to make obvious sense to your clients. And so you do get this sometimes where um, a company will try to invent a new category and say, oh, we're this new thing. Um, right now in tech, there's this company called uh, Magic Leap. And if you follow the tech news, they're doing this it, this thing that is so mind-blowingly difficult to understand, nobody can get what it is, but they've somehow managed to consume $500 million in resources building this thing. And if you ask them, what is it? They'll say, it's a new computing platform. No one gets that. No one gets it. And so part of what they do is augmented reality, and everybody knows in tech, everybody knows what that is. So they'll say, oh, okay, so you're augmented reality. And the frustration on the people that run this company, they're like, no, no. It's a computing platform. And see, here's the problem. If you tell me what it is, and that what it is makes no sense to me, then I will decide for you what you are, and it'll be something that makes sense to me. So these guys, because they do augmented reality, um, part of how you interact with their computing platform is through these virtual reality goggles. And so, but that's not what they do. It's just kind of ancillary thing. But the minute they showed people the goggles, everyone's like, oh, you're a VR goggle company. And they started comparing their goggles to everyone else's goggles. And it, that, that train is out of the station now. And so meanwhile, so if you read all their marketing materials and stuff, we're a new computing platform, whatever, nobody gets it. And so if no one gets it, then they will go back to this lowest common denominator thing that, that they'll say, okay, you're telling me all that, but I figure it's lies because I don't get it. So what you are is this, and you're not gonna like this. So the thing you have to do is figure out something that works, and you gotta test it, and if people are still going, yeah, but all those words coming out of your mouth don't actually mean anything to me, then you've got the wrong context. It's not easy, if it was easy, you know, we'd all be drinking out of a coconut in Fiji right now because we'd be so rich, because we're so awesome at differentiating ourselves. Sometimes it's actually extraordinarily difficult. So sometimes how you do it is you do it by being very specific on which customers you're going after, and then you describe the value that way. Sometimes you do it by getting really specific on this is the differentiation in the value. And so maybe that makes you an agency, maybe agency is a bad comparable. Maybe that makes you, you know, in a different business than promotional products. I don't know, I'm not an expert in your business. But that's the work you have to do to do this recontextualization is figure out what exactly could I do? How could I frame it to really make my stuff pop? But it's hard. Yeah. Hey. Go ahead. Um, your, your talk was really excellent. as my brain swirling around. Um, thinking about the focus that you're kind of recommending, you know, maybe it's not what you think you've built, but kind of getting a little bit laser focus, even if that means you leave out some market space that you wanted. Right. But also, I think about, like, I'm VP of sales at Common SKU, been in this industry a long time, so I can see both sides of tech platform and selling promo. Sometimes you walk into a client and they have a specific need that you do solve, but then you walk into a different client that has a different need that you also solve. Right. And so where do you, it's very hard to market everything, but also you want to be able to have a little bit of a broad reach and you have built these features or you do sell e-commerce and you also have inventory or you also um, you know, do a lot of custom import or all the different things that we do in our industry. When do you leave features behind, yeah. even if it means saying no versus kind of being the round peg and a round hole it's as hard, much as right? possible? It's hard, right? The say a no part is the scariest part of narrowing things down. Like my example of the CRM for investment bankers, Man, we spent three months in a room having arguments about exactly that, where the sales reps would say, so wait, you're telling me if a telco comes and says, here's $10 million, I'm going to say no. And I'm like, okay, A, telcos have never come to us and said, here's $10 million ever, so I love your fantasy, but not going to have it. And two, uh, here's the problem. If I am consistently selling a whole bunch of things, and some of those things aren't a great fit with my secret sauce, those are bad customers. 
They cost you money. They quit on you. They argue about what your cost is. They, they want a discount. They, you know, it's, it's hard to say no to business, but sometimes you have to. Generally, however, thinking about this stuff, one good way to think about it is you have limited resources that you use to go out and market and sell to people. What getting tight on your positioning helps you do is to figure out who are my low-hanging fruit customers, the people that are the best fit for my offering, the people that close the fastest, the people ask for the least amount of discounts, the people that are jumping up and down in their office when they see your stuff, and I'll spend my marketing resources all on that, trying to get those folks. And the other folks, yeah, if one walks into my office and says, here's 10 million and I want to do this thing and it's a little bit different, I think you're going to have to handle those on a case-by-case -case basis. But what it does say is you're going to narrow the resources you spend on who you go after. And if you stay focused on that, what should happen is you're so busy dealing with the easy people to close, you don't have time for these customers that are a little bit harder and you shouldn't anyway. I don't know if that makes sense. Last question, I think. So we April, first off, good, uh, good presentation. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned multiple times, though, that one of the issues about framing and positioning yourself came out of failed sales or attempts oh, yeah. that didn't work out. Yeah. You didn't, I don't think I heard you mention a particular technique of recognizing that at the time and using those essentially failed experiments as data points to your progress and your analysis. Right, so this is a good, this is a very good point. So the question is like, so I think what you're asking is, like, let's say we don't want to fail. <laughs> yeah, see, I'm an engineer. We learn from failure. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's exactly When things it. don't work, you gotta make sure when you know that. When things don't work, you gotta do. So generally, so I work with companies now, and most of the companies I work with are somewhat new. And so they have some limited experience in the market. And so most of them, we'll start with this, what I would call the default positioning. We set out to build a thing. We set out to sell something. And then what we're doing is we're looking at, does that work? And if it does, then we're asking ourselves, why? Sometimes it works because of reasons that we're not, you know, we're not entirely clear on, and then we can get tighter on the positioning. If the answer is no, it's not working, then we go through this process. Again, what have we got that's special? Is this the way we talk about it? In any new products I've launched where we're working really hard on making sure we get this right the first time, the trick is what I think kind of doesn't matter. What really matters is the customer's perception of it, so I have to test it. And so we've done lots of things where before a product is launched, we'll do these meetings with customers and say, hey, I've got this thing, it's a database, what do you think? And then you test the reaction and see, oh, okay, that doesn't work. <laughs> Let's go back and try it with something else. The more experimentation you can do, even if it's just a casual conversation with a customer, to give you a good feeling like, yeah, this is gonna work, the more you can do that before you say, okay, we're launching the campaign, we're spending the money, we're buying the AdWords, we're, all systems go, then the more risk you can pull out of it that you've got it wrong because you thought it sounded good to you, but your customers have no clue. So friends, friends of friends, relatives, pitch it, see how it goes before you go live. Yeah, and it's, and it's not just friends and relatives, it's friendly prospects. Because again, your relatives might have a different frame of reference than an oh, actual. Oh, they're pretty harsh. An actual, yeah, like, yeah, like your, your, your friendly sympathy sales call is generally very different than the one, a, a, a kind of skeptical prospect. But if you're doing testing stuff, it's usually best to go out, and you can do it with your existing customers too, go out and say, hey, I'm thinking about this, what do you think? Um, and then just get them talking and let them do it. All right. Thanks. All right, thanks very much, you guys are awesome. Thank you, Rachel. thank you. Thank you, April.